This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. In the game of health coverage, Farm Bureau Health Plans is the MVP. Tennesseans have relied on their unmatched rates, coverage, and service for over 77 years. With Amy Wells and Rhett Bryan of Titans Radio, the ever-reliable one, I'm Mike Keith. Welcome to the BetMGM studio. A preseason game is in the books, and we've brought it back because she's back. <laughs> it's the OTP Four Downs. Woohoo! This is a show, if you are new to the OTP, if you've just become one of the OT people in the last year. Welcome. Well, which by the numbers, most of you have. Yeah. Um, and thank you. We're happy you're here. We're very happy you're here. We used to do this on Mondays. Yes. After games. We would go through four downs. And the the feedback we got was actually quite fabulous from people. They were wonderful about it because like, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. And, you know, it, it's something where we take the game apart, kind of look at what's happened and what's to come. And I, I get to be a game show host. You do. Because I came up with the game. Are you contributing? Are you a contributing I game show host? I will be a contributor okay. in this. It, it'd be kind of like Alex Trebek chiming in on the questions. Well, he that... asks the questions, and sometimes he just gives the answers, too. Well, yeah, he was a very smart man. He was a very smart man. Do you ask yourself in third person? <laughs> <laughs> Would you well, like for me to? What is what is world economics, Mike, <laughs> for 300? <laughs> what is? Oh, <laughs> Thanks, no. Alex. Okay, so we're going to get on with uh, four downs here now that we've explained it properly. First down, who was your player of the game? And much to Amy's chagrin, I've already said – that no one can pick Chance Campbell, the linebacker, who had nine tackles, a sack, and the game-ending interception. And I said that because that's the person most people would go towards, would be Chance Campbell. He played very well. Yeah, he did. Everybody understands he, he had a really good game. Brian Callahan on Titans Radio after the game was effusive in his praise, which uh, I thought was quite a tell based on the fact that a lot of times coaches will say, yeah, he did okay, but I'm sure there were some things on – no, he's like, no, he stepped up. And and he really got a chance to play a lot of football and did well. The stat line didn't lie, oh, first yeah. of all. Leading tackler, interception, quarterback sack. But in an opportunity, I think he had his best game as a Titan preseason, regular season, right? I mean, he – you know – because he just hadn't had any opportunity. He got hurt last year. Right. Yeah. I mean, they thought he would come on and develop into a backup caliber linebacker, maybe even a guy who could push for playing time mm -hmm. last year. And then he gets hurt, and it's just basically a lost year for him. And so he stepped into the breach. And, you know, what's really happened is Jack Gibbons and Kenneth Murray are the first two linebackers. Right. And I don't know if that's going to change. But – Somebody else has to get in there and be able to take reps because the chances of them playing all 17 games, not great. That's not generally how it works with people who have a lot of contact in this league. And so Garrett Wallow, I mean, he was really playing well, and he was running with the twos a lot. He's out for the year with the torn pack. Then you've had some other injuries. Cedric Gray has, had, has been banged up and – so he, he is not getting a chance to take part. Luke Gifford went down on the opening kickoff with a concussion in the game against San Francisco. So suddenly somebody was going to get to take a lot of snaps early, middle, and late, and it was Chance Campbell. Yeah, it was. And, the, I mean, he, to Coach's point, rose to the occasion. He did exactly what you need to do when you are trying – to earn a spot on a professional football team, and that's make big plays and make sure everybody's talking about you the next day, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So Chance Campbell off the board as player of the game. I don't like you making rules like but that. It's, but, <laughs> but it's my game. Huh. Then yeah. you come up with your own game. The game within the game. Okay. The you game. Know? All right, that's fine. That's, so, that's me. Rhett Bryan, since you are our esteemed guest, mm -hmm. technically in the Snickers hot seat because you are the guest, Mm -hmm. Who is your player of the game from the Titans' 17-13 to win over San Francisco? Well, because you took Chance Campbell out of it, I'm going with the Amy Wells answer. I've got two 
<laughs> right off the top, we've been doing this Here we go. 30 seconds. Breaking the but, rules, uh, Rhett Bryan. Yep, right off the top. But I, I think these two should be mentioned seriously. And it's you, you affectionately called them the Jacksons last night. And Kiaris and Jaquan Jackson in the return games, man, I mean – they helped set the table. Those were two of the touchdown scoring drives right there. Really nice work by both of them. And both of them have had nice camps. You could make the case that those two players are battling for one spot mm -hmm. because you don't need two returners right. per se. Because they're gonna I think they're gonna use a lot of people on kickoffs during the course of the year. And they didn't use several guys on kickoffs in the game against San Francisco that they could have used. And yet these two guys might force you to keep them both because Jaquan Jackson is that sneaky guy and Kiaris Jackson can run, run, as yeah. Coach Mack likes to say. Well, and having two guys who have skill sets outside of the returner role where they can be plugged in is helpful. If you get to seven. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not roster mathing yet. I know. Uh, but I but, guess we need to. I, well, you've got to start to think about, do you get to seven receivers? And when Brian Callahan made the comment in his postgame press conference that he said something about on game day five or six. Some it's got to make you go. Well, some mm -hmm. of the media immediately jumped to, wait a minute, does that mean you're going to keep seven? And it's like, not, not necessarily. But the other, I mean, you got to think about Kyle Phillips, and you have to think about Mason Kinsey. Mason Kinsey it's, forces you to. Yeah, there's a log jam. At, at the slot receiver position. There well, and Mason's thing is he can play all three spots. He's He's been able – I mean, he's been here five years. So he has the, the wherewithal to be able to play any of the three receiver spots, and he has some returnability, and he certainly didn't hurt himself against San Francisco with the way he played. Is he your player of the game? Maybe he is Wells? not my player of the game. Okay. D uh, different Mason, actually. Mason Rudolph is my player of the Man, game. That's a good one. And I know it's kind of the vanilla choice, and I, I recognize that. Why but, do you say that? Well, I mean, the quarterback's the player of the game. Good one. But <laughs> this team has been looking for a reliable, really solid backup quarterback that's a veteran for a minute. I think that's something that this team has really needed is somebody who is a proven performer, who can learn the offense quickly, who can be a leader, who knows what they're doing. And Mason Rudolph came in and showed that he is as advertised. He can I mean he can make the plays, he can run the offense. This can go really well. He is a great guy for that spot and I think he showed that in this game. If the Titans got into a situation where Will Levis was lost for a very extended period of time. Do you believe Mason Rudolph could lead the team to victories to the point that, say, Garner Minshew did in Indianapolis a year ago? Yeah, I think I based too. on what we saw last night, I think that's exactly what this team is looking for. And, yeah, I think he could do it. Mikey did it in Pittsburgh down the stretch last year. Well, I think and that's the standard I think Rand Carthon wanted in going and getting a backup is if Will Levis is not able to play, we need to have another guy who not only ensures that our season isn't sunk – but that we can go win. And I, I think to your point, and the way he played at the end of last year, he he showed it. I mean, Mason Rudolph has developed. Brian Callahan has been very up on him, uh, very excited about what he does. He's been excited about all three quarterbacks. H history will tell you, too. I mean, think about this. If you have no Neil O'Donnell in 1999, there's no way that the Titans get close to the playoffs and, and try to make – a run that was, you know, just short of being magical. But, I mean, because, you know, Steve McNair is banged up and has the back and all that. He does a great job with that. Four and one. Right. Team starts one and oh. Steve McNair, it's announced the next day, needs back surgery in Los Angeles. Going to miss six weeks. And the Titans go four and one with Neil O'Donnell at quarterback before Steve McNair comes back after the bye. And um, then the team knocks off the St. Louis Rams to get to 6-1 and one on Halloween. That's a great point. You know, if, if you'll remember, too, the Titans signed him. I believe the date was July the 24th. It was that late that they brought Neil O'Donnell in. Wow. 
You know my favorite Neil O'Donnell story? What, Mike? Can I share this with the OT people? Yes, please. So it's the early days of Titans Radio, obviously. You know where I'm, you know where I'm going with this one? I do. Go. Oh, okay. So it's the early days of Titans Radio. And we went to visit a radio station. I'm not going to say where. And the guy who was the host of the morning show is no longer with us. Okay. And we liked him. We, we liked him very much because he put our games on and we were just so very appreciative. But we went, Larry Stone and I went out during the bye week and we go in to be on this guy's morning show. And the guy said, <laughs> right off the bat, he goes, I got a bone to pick with you guys. <laughs> this was the way he talked. I got a bone to pick with you guys. It's like, well, okay. You know, it's the, I mean, we're five and one. I mean, it's gone pretty well. He goes, I'm just going to say, if y'all ain't going to play Neil McDonald at quarterback anymore, <laughs> then I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be rooting for this team. Larry and I are trying, you know, obviously his name is Neil O'Donnell, not Neil McDonald. And that was the way he said it too. <laughs> like old McDonald have a, has a farm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, <laughs> so he c continues on with this diatribe about, Neil McDonald has led this team, and everybody believes in Neil McDonald. <laughs> and we are <laughs> we're trying desperately not to laugh. <laughs> because and, and you're like, well, I mean, you really can't correct the guy on his own radio show. At that yeah. point, he is Neil McDonald. He's Neil. So, so Larry's making the argument, and Larry being ever the professional that, that he remains to this day, he's like, well – He's like, so-and-so, again, I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, so-and-so, he goes, Neil O'Donnell is, has done a wonderful job, and Neil O'Donnell is a tremendous player, and Neil O'Donnell was brought in to be the backup. Steve McNair, when he's healthy, is going to be this team's quarterback. Silence. Just, just lays it down for him. Yeah. Just totally gives him the, the chance to just totally pick it up. He goes, Larry, you're very smart. But don't tell me about Neil McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Never went in one year and out the other. No, well, no, I don't think it went he wasn't in. Even listening. I don't think he. I don't think he knew his name was Neil O'Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to throw that in. It's just, that was really good. It's a favorite story, though. <laughs> really good. <laughs> we went outside, and I mean, we laughed for forty-five miles to the next. Stop. So hard at one point that I had tears streaming down my face. That's awesome. All right, second down. Top th – oh, no, I've got to do my You didn't do yours. Of the game. Golly, we're Chance rusty. <laughs> no. <laughs> Cannot be Cannot. Chance Campbell. So, <laughs> but you made the Red's show. Reds was the Jacksons. Yep. Amy's was Mason Rudolph. Mine is the dynamic kickoff. That's my player of the game. Wait a minute. The dynamic kickoff. Gieras at the 7, to the 10, to the 15, to the 20, to the 25, to the 30, to the 35, to the 40. Stays on his feet midfield. 40. And he is finally oh, out of bounds as he gets into and inside the 30-yard line. They'll say that's where he stepped out at the 30. 63 yards for Kiaris Jackson. That's not a person. I didn't say it had to be a person. Player. Yeah. It's an element. All right. Proceed. I love it. I'm not allowing it. I love it. I love that we have kickoffs and kickoff returns again. And I, I was for taking the kickoff completely out of the game because I was so tired of seeing touchbacks. That's 100% true. That is true. It's not because I didn't like the kickoff. I, and, and I understood the safety part of it. I understood it 100% that it was not a safe play. And I'm for player safety. But I was not for – watching kickers see how far they could kick it and seeing guys in the end zone doing this. You were tired of touchbacks. That's not a play. That That's some guy at a – It's a formality. It's, a, it's some guy at a driving range, and it was disgusting in the <laughs> Super Bowl. I mean, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Just guys disgusting. trying to – Instead of guys trying to hit the ball as far as they could – at the driving range, these were just kickers kicking the ball as far as they could. Mm -hmm. I did not want to see Harrison Butker and Jake Moody do that in the Super Bowl, what, 13 times? 
Something there, like sounds that. Right. there were no returns in the Super Bowl. This great game. And 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 yet they found this play and they're gonna have to tinker with it. But it's an it's a football play. It's not junk. It's not quirky. It's not uh, you know, it's not all goofed up. Again, I think I think they're gonna have to get into the thing a little bit about is it the twenty, is it the thirty, is it the forty? The live ball thing, obviously, in the Jacksonville preseason game was a big deal. Ball went into the end zone. The guy thought, because it went into the end zone, that he could field it and then back up into the end zone and that it would be a touchback. But it's a live ball. It was a safety. Right. Oh. So, I mean, there's there are little things with it that way. And I get it. Yeah. And I get it's not traditional. But remember, guys used to play without face masks. Guys and here we are used now. to play without helmets. Yeah. I mean, the football used to be round. The game is ever-changing. Yeah. So You're, that, you are pleased. That was my player of the game, the dynamic kickoff. Well, I want to change my player to the Jumbotron. Okay. If this That's is what fine. we're doing. <laughs> Second down. <laughs> top thing that stood out about the Tennessee Titans. Amy Wells. Uh, the tempo of the offense. Okay. And kind of the variety of the offense. I think everybody walked away, everybody that I talked to anyway after the game said, whoa, look at that Titans offense. It looked different. It looked fresh. Things were moving. There, were, You saw a variety of plays. I mean, in terms of first downs, it was really kind of balanced whether they were achieved via passing the ball or running the That's ball. That's right. Like It was just a really different offense that was kind of zinging around, which I know is not a football word. No, it, but it's true. But, and, and mine is very similar to mm -hmm. yours based on the ability to convert third downs on offense. Yeah. They had a lot of manageable third downs. They, If they needed six yards, they ran a play and got seven yards and kept the chains moving. Coach, and there was variety. Coach Mack made the point on Titans Radio consistently about that this wasn't just going to be a deep shot offense. It was going to be a chain-moving offense. So the tempo, the variety, the ability to convert third downs. Because when the Titans had gotten really special offensively from 2019 to 2020, 21 the three years they were really good on third down yep you have to be because they had the versatility to be able to be good in the last two years that's gone away they converted 34 percent of third downs a year ago but so much of that comes from first and second down yeah I mean you have to be able to to be putting yourself in good positions for third right. down so you have to have a lot of things going on but uh, the amount of people that are able to get involved in this offense. And, I mean, we just saw a, a preseason rather vanilla offense. But you still saw that there's a lot of things that are happening and a lot of people that are getting involved. And this is new and exciting for the Titans. And uh, I'm just very excited about it. That stood out to me. My top takeaway was the improved techniques and things under the tutelage of – Bill Callahan, this wow. offensive line. Good one. And uh, in all three sets of guys throughout that entire ballgame. Just think about it. One, importantly, nobody touched the quarterback. There was no penalties on the offensive line. There was one in the fourth quarter for illegal formation. That was Bryce Oliver who left his guy uncovered. So there's no penalties. And, I mean, we go back to the third down conversions, all these things. They're a major part of that. Well, and remember this, too, to take your point a step further. Holding is always one of the points oh, of emphasis yep. in the preseason. they got to yeah. knock the rust off the officials. Do. Yeah, we're going to call. Well, they call virtually every hold in the preseason based on the fact that they want to go back and be able to show it to the teams. Okay, you, you know, John, you can't do this. Bob, right. you can't try this. And that goes to the technique. Because so much of what the call ends up being is the perception of what the official thinks he sees. Yeah. And by the way, this is Brad Allen. You had three accepted penalties with Brad Allen's crew yeah. in the first preseason game. That is incredible. That's amazing. And that <laughs> might be the player of the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. Brad Allen. Brad Allen. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Keep it moving there. <laughs> but they didn't have a holding penalty. No. And that's not to say they won't. Right. But – if you if you know what they're gonna call, don't do that. Yep. 
You know, if you know they're going to think they see a grab or a jerk in this way, shape, or form, then then don't do that. And so learn a technique where you're not showing that look. There, there are going to be moments you get called for holding. If you miss your block and your quarterback's going to get smoked, you're probably going to tackle a guy. Yep. I mean, it's it's going to happen. But don't don't give it away or don't – Put yourself in that position initially because your technique is something that allows it. That's a wonderful point. I just I, I kept looking through the night and then, of course, looking through the game book again. I'm like, yeah, there was no penalties. There was no quarterback sacks. I'm sure there's plenty of things that Bill Callahan is, is pointing out and saying, hey, we got to do this, we got to do that. That's what a coach does. But, my goodness, what a difference that man has made on that group of young men. Well, the offense and Bill Callahan, because, I mean, get the ball out of the quarterback's hands so the offensive line doesn't need to protect for five seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's kind of a two-way street yep. in all of that. And the Titans' offense before, by design, was not as fast an offense. It was, you know, the play-action deep shots, and, and it worked. It worked, yeah. Until it didn't. And now you're changing to something that's that's quicker. And I think it definitely helps the offensive line. That's really good, Red. Hey, Titans fans. SeatGeek makes it easy to find tickets so you can be part of all the touchdown celebrations. Whether you're buying or selling tickets, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek is the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The most disruptive idea in ticketing, a ticket that works. Expect the expected. Seat Geek. It's an exclamation point. Seat Geek. We'll work on it. No, that's just geek. No, yeah. Seat Geek. <laughs> that's punctuation. <laughs> that, punctuation, that's Mike, is important. <laughs> wow. Mm. Dork. No. <laughs> you have to you've give it some you've gusto. You've got to read it like an announcer. Okay, You're, but an exclamation point. Well, I did. Seat Geek. No, that, listen to how that sounds. Seat Geek. It yeah, sounds excited. Yeah, we're not getting on the ride at Disney. We're excited wow. for Seat Geek. Oh, boy. All I right. know. Seat Geek. No, you say it like you're in trouble. No, I just said Seat Geek. Professional announcer. Mm -hmm. All right, Amy, who surprised <laughs> you as we go to third down? Not a person. It's a thing that surprised oh, me. Oh, okay. The question was what surprised you, Mike? Okay. Mm hmm. hmm. Okay. Anyway, what surprised you? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. write that down. Professional announcer got it wrong. Um, what surprised me, and this is as a sideline reporter, the offense and the defense switched bench sides, which has completely baffled my mind. And this is on the heels of offense and defense switching jersey colors in, in practice, practice, also messing with my mind. So this team is just determined to confuse me and I understand I talked to Ramon Foster after about it because when he came back up I ran into him coming back from the field and I said did it flip you out that everyone was on opposite sides because that would have really like thrown me and he said well I was surprised when I came out of the tunnel and there were offensive linemen looking at me because usually they were on the very the far side, side of yeah. the field and so we were talking about that, and he said, as somebody who played in the league for a long time, he would probably know, that with new coaches, sometimes you're switching the juju, and everything is different, and this is a new team, new staff, new everything. Let's just change it. Let's switch sides, see how we feel. Let's switch jerseys, see how we feel. You're getting different mojo going. It's a new everything. And I get that. But my brain cannot you don't like change i don't like change and i don't like i mean it's so consistent can we go over all the things you don't like no just i don't think OT we need people i don't think new? we need to do that yes what else don't i like don't like dancing i don't i don't like dancing like on the internet mm -hmm. no yeah that's one thing. Does that bother you? No. That I don't I mean, want to do, just, like... We just need to establish some things. Okay. I, what else? I don't like birds. No, you... She, she <laughs> I, I don't like... like I mean, bird. there's a lot of things I don't like. Oh, yeah. Creatures of most wow, kinds. right. I don't like a certain... I don't like olives. 
I don't, yeah, sure. There's a lot of things I don't like. I don't like it when people wear really, really short shorts to practice. Yeah, tr- I wish they really, wouldn't. That really bothers you. Yeah, that one really bothers me. But this bothers me because this has been consistent for a thousand years. <laughs> Everybody has been in the same place been. wearing certain colors. Yes. And now it's backwards. It's too hard. Okay. I don't like it. That's what surprised me. Rhett Bryant, third down. What surprised you? And in fairness, the question was, what surprised? What surprised? Yeah. Sure was. Yeah. Uh, I go back to the, your excitement over the kickoff rules. I was surprised that it was as clean and well executed as it was, which speaks to both special teams coordinators uh, in the first preseason game as far as execution. And, and, be, and also going back to Brad Allen, I'm like, well, we're, there's going to be flags on this stuff. I just – we've seen it in, you know, a, a short sample size window in the few games that, you know, have happened prior to the Titans' first preseason game. And mostly it has been clean. But you just didn't know, you know, there's so many layers to what's changed. But I was surprised that it was executed so clean. I think the play itself is going to be much less penalized, though. With the players being closer together, I think the blocks are going to be cleaner. I think the tacklers are going to be in better position. Less, less reckless margin. abandoned. Yeah. I, I just think less yeah. opportunity. There, there will be some holds, and yeah. there will be blocks in the back, and there will be face masks and horse collars, I'm sure, at times. But I think it's a good football play. And in the games that I've been watching, I've thought the same thing. Can you tell them for it? You are really on a, board. That makes me happy, though. But yeah, and Mike's right. I mean, it's a meaningful play. It's a very meaningful play. From start play. to finish, but, it's usually a meaningful play But, I mean, now. you see Kiaris Jackson go 63 yards. Dang it's right. exciting. It's fun. Yeah. That's a ball play, man. That's yeah. why we like football. A guy running with the ball, breaking a tackle, and then somebody from San Francisco tracking him down. And I mean, it was a really good play. Yeah. What surprised me is the overall enthusiasm for Andrew Rupsich in the offensive line. And here's what I mean by that. And I mean this as a a great positive. Ramon talked to me at practice the other day about Rupsich and how much he had improved technique-wise. And I thought, you know, in watching him some, you know, specifically after Sadiq Charles was making his decision to retire, I'm like, is Rupsich in this thing? And he very clearly is. Uh, Brian Callahan shouted him out again at the postgame press conference that Rupsich continues to do good things. And I, and I say this. I mean, he started two of the last three games a year ago at right guard when Brunskill got hurt. But it's, it's as if it's very similar to Mason Kenzie. Mason Kenzie's in this thing. I don't know if he's going to make the 53, but he clearly has his best chance – to make the 53 for the first time since he got here, the initial 53, that is. Rupsich does too. And, you know, Mason Kenzie comes out of Barry College. Rupsich comes out of Culver Stockton College, which is an NAIA school. And when I saw it initially, I think for six months, I was convinced it was somewhere in California. I I was convinced it was somewhere in Northern California. It is not. It is not. It is in Canton, Missouri. Yeah. You know, they've liked Rupsich since he got here. The former staff liked him and his progress. But you, for this whole offseason, we heard all these names being thrown about, oh, here, this, these are going to be your five and whatever. His name was never mentioned as a possibility. And not, not because people were not doing their jobs. It's just like, is he a continuous practice squad guy? He's in it, man. Right. I, I mean, he and Raiden's, I think, are going to have a battle. Let me tell you what else I like about Culver Stockton. What? Because I was looking up their website again just to make sure I had some of this right. They're the Wildcats. Okay. So they have their own official Wildcats podcast or whatever. They actually – looks like they have multiple podcasts. Good job. But they refer to them as podcasts. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's pretty good. That's re- Culver Stockton. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo <laughs> the, the for the podcast. podcast. They got podcasts. Bravo for the podcasts. <laughs> Almost as good as the OTP, but not quite. I mean, shoot, if we could do podcasts and make it work, I'd do it in a second. I mean, I'd fully steal it. Can you imagine it. how great that meeting was? Listen, guys. Listen. 
Let's I call, have an idea. Let's call, and, and you know everybody in the room went, that's really dope. <laughs> they went, mur, mur. Yeah, but then it stuck. But then they're walking around going, you know, it's pretty good. That's how we got OT people. It was going to be OT peons. Yeah, but, and but, I said, no, it, because you're better than that. You're better. Yeah. It's a derogatory connotation. You, you know? think so? Yeah, you're not a peon. A you're a people. A lot of people thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, I know. No, it is funny, it but it's, funny. it's, you know, for the fan, it's like, no, nah, come on, man. Yeah. Yeah. But there were only like 16 people at the time. Yeah, we could call I them mean, whatever we wanted. They, they all didn't called care. us on our home phones at that yeah. point and told hey, us it was a bad idea. Is yeah. episode coming out. I mean, it was my mom and like Neil McDonald of- me <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not going to follow this team if he's not the quarterback. <laughs> Neil <anymore>. McDonald ain't the <laughs> quarterback. I think, I think he bought a farm now. <laughs> <laughs> Neil McDonald has a farm. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm telling you, though, keep an eye on 76. Yeah. And it's a good story. He's a good player. He was really always meant to be a guard. They thought that's where he would end up because he's not the long arm guy. I guess he's six six, three twenty five, mm-hmm. you know, something like that. But he doesn't have like the thirty six inch arms. That's going to be a battle. And there may be other. Latavius Simmons may get in that too. He played a lot of snaps at guard and has done some good things. So, again, you know, that to me. Starting last week when Ramon said what he did, I was like, well, I was kind of thinking, and I don't know anything about offensive line. I just know who's rotating in. Right. And I, I thought to myself, are we seeing what we think we're seeing? And, and we are. So good for him and uh, good for Culver Stockton. <laughs> what or who are you watching over the next seven days, Rep Brian? The player that I am watching over the next seven days is linebacker James Williams. Okay. And I, I, first of all, he has a fascinating story um, as to, you know, how he made his decision to, to go play for the University of Miami. But, you know, he was number one safety prospect in high school that year coming out. Yeah, he was a top 15 player, and he was a consensus five-star. Right. Which is crazy. And so, you know, his mo- mother is tragically uh, passes away when he's a little kid. And, you know, it, uh, the story he tells is that uh, he had offers everywhere because of how well uh, he was sought after. And when he heard the story that his mother, who used to work at the University of Miami when she was pregnant with him, would say, my little boy's going to play for the hurricane someday. He heard that story. That was the end of it. And, you know, certainly uh, had a nice career there. But he's 6'4", going on 6'5", and now 240 pounds. And there aren't many safeties that play that. I mean, Mel Blunt for the steel curtain defense wasn't that big. He's pretty close. But just seeing him go to that next level in the middle level of the defense and then talking to linebackers coach Frank Bush about him, there's a little twinkle in Frank Bush's eyes, like, hey, you know, I think there's something we can do with this guy. I think he can – I think he's somebody we can bring along. And Lord knows he's physical now. He can thump. That dude can thump. Had quarterback hit, a couple of tackles in well, the first preseason game. Hey, the Titans did well on the two seventh round picks. The mm-hmm. third day, period. Yeah. yeah. The third day yeah, of the draft for right. Rand Carthon and that staff. It, it, it's exciting. It, it is yeah, now. because Brownlee had a good game after having had really good yes. practices. And Jaquan Jackson had the punt return. And, yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good point. Uh, Cedric Gray is really the only one we haven't had a chance to see mm-hmm. enough of yet. And uh, I still think he's going to end up being a really good player. But James Williams comes out of the same area, Miami Gardens, Florida, as, as Jarvis Brownlee. They've known each other since they were kids, oh, played against each other. Hey, it's serious ball, man. I mean, the the ball down there and the prospects that have come out over the last 40, 50 years, it's crazy who's from there. You heard Rand Carthon tell us the other day. He said, these guys are just different. They're wired different. Mm-hmm. They're mature. Like, these guys come in here, pin their ears back, and go for it. And that's exactly what – I think James Williams is going to be a very intriguing player for the Titans in the next three or four months. All right, Amy Wells. Fourth down, who or what are you watching over the next seven days? Well, Mike Keith, I'm going to be watching Chance Campbell. Oh. And I can say that because it wasn't the first question. Well, it was the fourth. That's well played. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But really, I mean, it, 
all of the momentum in the world is on Chance Campbell's side right now. He's mm-hmm. had great practices. He's gotten a lot of opportunities to get reps. He just had a great game. Now what do you do with it? Because we've got the Seahawks coming into this building. And these practices are going to be intense and there's going to be a lot of opportunities to show what you can do and show that you're consistent and show that you're legit. Now is your time to do that, Chance Campbell. So that's who I'm going to be watching to see if he can continue to grow, continue to solidify himself as a part of this defense and earn that spot. Well, and and as Mike said earlier, he's he was kind of the forgotten man in all this because of the injury last year. Right. And, He's top of mind now, to your point. And if he can stack those days, as the guys say, especially against uh, you know a Seattle team that's coming in here Wednesday and Thursday, and then you know obviously a preseason game Saturday. Yeah, you're right. Ball's in his court. He can make the most out of the situation. I'm watching Tavondre Sweat. Oh, that's a good one. Ooh. Uh, he has done a really, really nice job. What has impressed me most about him is not missing a rep, not missing practice playing 12 snaps against San Francisco, which was all he was going to play, but staying on the field, looking like a guy who can be a three-down player, who can give this team 30 to 40 snaps a game as a starter, running with the ones. I love the way they have handled him. They've said, you're playing. We're not, we're not going to play the funny games where we do the, oh, you've got to work your way up. It's like, nope. We expect you to play and play now, and so here we go. For the next seven days, I want to see him keep it up. I want to see, you know, keeping it up in the two practices against Seattle. Don't know if he'll play in the game. I would guess if any of those guys do, it would be him because Jeffrey's not going to play. Um, I think we know what Jeffrey Simmons looks like. I think, yeah, I, we know I think we're good do. there. I think we're, we understand Harold that. Landry. Yeah, yeah same thing. But I, I'm talking about the defensive line. Mm-hmm. I mean, several of the defensive linemen showed up. Keandre Colburn showed up. And I think, you know, having Colburn show up was a big thing for this team. Davidson showed up. McClendon showed up. Uh, Joseph Day played some, but they were going to get him out of there. Tavondre is – one of the most unusual prospects the Tennessee Titans have ever had. We have never had a player like this. In 26 seasons, we have never – he he reminds me some of Henry Ford from back in the early days. Big, but a chance to be even better than oh, Henry Ford. Oh, yeah. And Henry Ford didn't have that. No, and he's not like – Albert Hainsworth, because Albert wasn't a nose. You'll remember what a fit Albert threw when he went to Washington for all that money and they made him a nose tackle. And Albert is incredibly unique. But this player is so much bigger and plays this position potentially next to Jeff. I mean, he can be he can be a program changer, so to speak, if he can keep this up couple things on Tavondre when I'm thinking about him. And, and you're right. The Titans have never had a guy like this because that guy typically has been in Baltimore or New England. Mm-hmm. He has. Or Pittsburgh. It's a good point. But absolutely Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, but when I think about how well he has started in this camp and how well things have gone, you said two of the three names that immediately come to mind that I think contribute to that. One is certainly Jeffrey Simmons. To his mentor and former uh, Longhorn teammate and Keandre Co- Coburn, that's big. And then Tracy Rocker, his position coach. I think those are three mainstay forces in his life. And I would probably put Rand Carthon in there uh, as um, well, the his, people his that are – His greatest champion. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, he he was the great champion that, that got him here. The story was told they went down to see him the week before the draft uh, as a group to sit down with him – to make him understand this is what it is, and it's a job. And if you, if you work with anybody in any field, you love the people who are just there every day, that you can, you, you don't want to, but you can sort of take them for granted because you know they're just going to show up. There are people that you work with in any field who are spectacular. 
and you're like, oh, so-and-so's really got it, and then the next day they have a hangnail and they're not there or they don't feel like doing the work and whatever. That's so much of what the NFL is. Yeah. The, yeah. Guy, the guys who show up every single day, it's like we're talking about a Mason Kenzie. Yeah. It's the consistent people. Uh, uh, Nick Westbrook Akine, Jeffrey Simmons. Yep. Sometimes it's great players. Sometimes it's good players. Sometimes it's mid-level players. But the people who are consistent workers always get the benefit of the doubt and have a chance. And if Tavondre continues to become that, especially at 22, he's going to have a very special NFL career. Well, and you're, you're right. Because it, it's not about yesterday, and it's not necessarily about tomorrow. It's it's just everything that happens today and just keeps stacking and moving. And you're right. You gave some excellent examples. Nick Westbrook-Akine is one of the gold star members of the Consistency Club. I mean, it, it's amazing what he does because he is – you call me the ever-reliable? He is ever-reliable. Well, he really yeah. is. But Tavondre, I think that's – when I talk about him having those people championing for him – he has. He doesn't have an accountability partner. He's got partners, plural. That's true. That that I believe all in their own way are showing him that classic how to be a pro. Well, and if he takes to that and continues to take to that, shoot. that is, you know how good the Titans OTP people. Uh, <laughs> do you know how good that's going to be? Oh my goodness! Pretty good. Whoa. Well, it's funny because I got to. Um, do something really fun last week. So Sirius XM NFL Radio does a training camp tour, and they go to all 32 camps. And I have gotten the chance to do some work with them in the past and appreciate Nick Pavlados and, and all of those guys, Tom Kress, and being really nice. And they, they allow me to host the Titans training camp um, look. And Charles Davis was here, and so we got to do that together. And we were talking to Jeffrey Simmons, and – one of the discussion points about Tracy Rocker with Jeffrey Simmons is the fact that he's coached in college recently, and he has a son, Kamar, who obviously just got through playing in college. I think, and Jeffrey agreed, that he gets this generation of players. Tracy's been around a while, and Tracy was a great college player in his own right, and yet you could say, as he gets close to 60, oh, they didn't do it like that in my day and whatever. But then there are some of these guys who have gotten that the younger people of today are different than the younger people of 10 years ago, particularly at that position, because you've got to be able to push that button and connect in that way. And Tracy Rocker is a guy who's already done it with Jeffrey Simmons and you sense it's happening with Tavondre Sweat, too. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very interesting point because I think that that's one of the things that separate good coaches that are really able to connect with their players from good coaches who don't necessarily always have the locker room with them. Sometimes it's not that you're a bad coach or a bad teacher or anything like that, but there is something about connecting, especially with this younger generation of player their whole worlds have been different and they have been so dramatically different as players. There's such an emphasis on mental health now that there wasn't even five years ago. Oh yeah. There's such an emphasis on the way that you take care of your body. There's all of the sudden money that they've been exposed to well before anybody else normally would have been exposed to money and all of the hardships that come with that. It's just a different world and being able to connect with guys and understand what those challenges are for them, how to channel all of that stuff into being productive on the field is so important. Well, now. and so many of the non-skill position guys have now gotten a lot of publicity in their life yeah. be because of social media. And that's never happened Ever. before. It, because it was always about the quarterback and the running back and the wide receiver and occasionally someone at a different spot. But now all of these players are used to having had attention, and they went through COVID. Yeah. And that created a kind of, and, and if you have kids of that age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was a different set of challenges. They reacted differently. And th just various components of what is important. And, and this is not even, and you make such a good point, 
This is just in the last five years. This isn't even kids who are late 20s. No. These are these are early to mid-20s who've come out of the last five years. And to be able to connect is huge. It's it's in my mind the differentiating component between good teams and great teams across the NFL. And it sounds like such a ridiculous thing because it doesn't even have anything to do with the talent of the players, but the ability to make that connection especially with the young players, I think is going to end up being a separator. And that's why we're seeing so many coaches getting hired for these jobs and you're going, "Really? That guy?" Huh, that seems odd. He doesn't really have the pedigree we expected, or he doesn't really have the mentality that we expected, or this is why. They can connect with those people. That's right. They can talk to them. It's just different. They can get it out of them. They can make a move when a lot of us really can't. Your point is so valid, Amy. Because <laughs> really can't. <laughs> Who are you po- talking to? All of us. Yeah. Well, easy. <laughs> the, the, the world. Your point is, is so valid, though, because when I think about and you're right about Tracy Rocker. I think Bill Callahan is the same way. The best coaches are the best communicators. And the the first communicator checklist thing you've got to have is being a good listener. So they're already good in their own skill sets with those things. And I think they just take them another layer and apply them as to trying to make that connection who may be three, four generations younger than them. And, and, but I think they have that innate thing in them to, to do just that. I mean, telling a kid to not look at social media during football season is not a legitimate request any longer. It can't happen. It doesn't exist. For a, and a lot of those reasons are monetary reasons. Sure. These kids are making money on social yeah. media, so they can't not. Okay, so how do we navigate this knowing that they are going to see the things that are being said about them. They are going to be engaging with this content all of a sudden. I remember so clearly when I started in the NFL, guys were not supposed to be on social media. Guys were not supposed to be on their phones. They were not supposed to be tweeting. They were not supposed to be engaging in that at all during football season. And it was something that we, like, the team kind of monitored because it was a way to focus in and not be looking at that stuff. That's a great point. But now... It's not an option. And that's one example of a thousand of just the ways that these coaches have to completely change the way that they are engaging with these guys because it's a, a different world. And so for a Bill Callahan or for a Tracy Rocker or even, I mean, even Brian Callahan to understand, all right, these are things that are going to be a part of our lives. How can we adjust to use them as strengths as opposed to distractions in Every facet of what these guys are doing, it's different, and it takes a special kind of coach to do that. Well, and and also, you have to understand what's important to this group, and even if it doesn't make sense to you based on how you were raised or just what you thought or whatever. Doesn't matter. (laughs) You've got to be accepting of it to the point that you say, okay, we've got to make this allowance to understand that, and you find a place to meet in the middle. Yep. 100%. 100%. It's like, guys, we would appreciate it if you don't tweet in meetings. Yeah, please don't it, do that. If you don't video this. But we know, hey, let's take a selfie on the way in from practice. Compromise. Or, absolutely. Yeah. Compromise. Yeah, because to, to Amy's point, they're going to be on their phones. They want to see what other people are doing. They yep. connect with other players. And they want to have that ability to market themselves in this way. And it, if you think that's wrong if you think that's self-indulgent if you whatever okay i got that but this is the world this is where we are this is where we are and they have and and understanding the brand part of it and getting that is a is a huge factor tavandre sweat is a guy who is well known on social media because he's a good guy He's a big guy. He's a really good football player. He's, He's a funny. lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And but that's part of his life. Yeah. And that's not going to change because some coach from nineteen well, really, some coach from twenty fifteen right. comes in and says, Well, let me tell you something, son, this is not gonna happen. I don't care yeah. about this, I don't care about that. Yeah. Yep. Neil McDonald. Neil <laughs> McDonald is good. It just yeah. doesn't but work anymore. That well, it's not <laughs> It's not even functional. Mm-mm. Nope. 
you find the compromise part of it or else you just don't. Well, they just turn it off, right? The, the Those players, they'll just turn it off. They want to know why. Mm-hmm. And for us, not so much for you, but for us, why was because I said so. That's what we heard. Do as I say, not as I do. Don't ask. Right. And and that wasn't necessarily as bad as it was. That's just the way it was. Yep. We, I mean, ask why? I mean, you wouldn't think to ask why. Now, if you're in a position of leadership, really anywhere, but certainly on an NFL team, you've got to be prepared to talk about that. Yeah. And talk about the why. And it's really interesting how this entire organization, over a period of several years, has come to that and uh, started years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was an understanding because ownership gets this. Yes. Yeah. And so it's not like it just happened in this off season, but this group that they've hired is a continuation of that process. Absolutely. I mean, to your point, this is something that Amy Adams Strunk, we've seen around this building, has has recognized for a really long time. And that's why even the amount of resources that she put into redoing the cafeteria, redoing the locker room, redoing the right room, redoing all of these spaces where players were, it's part of it, and making it so beautiful, was that guys were seeing what other teams' facilities looked like because it was on social oh, media. That's right. Guys knew that, like, hey, I play for the Titans, and these are our resources. What in the world do the Jets have? What in the world do the Jags have? What in the world? And so guys are starting to share those notes. <laughs> guys are starting to talk. Guys want to be proud of where they are. They want to be putting it on social media. They want to be. It's part of the affinity for an organization. And Amy understood that from the jump. And that's one example, but there were millions. Could we do a whole podcast on just this? I think we just I did. I think we this, could. This podcast <laughs> is now into its sixth hour. I mean, we really Max just. Max Walsh is asleep over I know. Here. <laughs> well, he's part of that generation. Yeah, he is. Know? He truly is. He's <laughs> sleepy. Rhett, sleepy. thank you for joining us. This was fun. Yes. Four, to do four downs again? Oh, isn't it great? Doesn't well, it feel good? Why don't we tingly? do We're, we're going to do another OTP between now and the Seattle preseason game. Mm -hmm. But we could do this again next weekend after the Can Seattle. we do it after Seattle? Yes. Guys, I think we're bringing it back. I don't know. I think we are. I don't know. That I think it's happening. Maybe go with the rules show. Uh, no, I don't think so. People like it. <laughs> I like it. For Rhett Bryan and A.B. Wells, I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for joining us for the OTP.